It's more room on this side. We'll start then. What it went up? <laughs> Just keep looking. If it turns off by itself during class, turn it back on. If it turns off again, turn it back on. It's good. Okay, let's get started. So, welcome to Six Seventy Seven, Spring Two Thousand Seventeen. My name is Prashant, I will be the instructor for this class. So what I will do today is to give you an introduction to what this course is about, talk a little bit about the syllabus and uh, just do some introductory material on distributed systems. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so as you know, uh, this course actually has two sections. This is the classroom section. There is also uh, an online section where the students will be following along using recorded video. So every class is going to be recorded and I'm going to make the video available. Okay, that's not a reason for those of you who are here to stop showing up to class. Okay, there are several students in the other section who wanted to be here, but there is no room. So I asked them to take the other section. So if you decide for whatever reason that you are better off just following along using recorded video, let me know because there may be students who may want to swap with you. Okay, but if you are here, please come to class. I don't stop coming because uh, you actually are in the right to be here. Okay? Uh, so, two sections. As far as the course is concerned, it's exactly the same for both sections. There will be the same homework, same uh, lab, same exams. The only difference is uh, you get to come to class to hear the lectures. The other section is going to get the lecture a few hours later by video. Okay, beyond that everything is the same. Okay. Uh, there is a course web page that uh, I will show you where uh, the course syllabus is posted okay. and uh, there will be other material posted there as well. Okay, so uh, whatever I am going to talk about here, if you go to the course web page, there is a syllabus there that is uh, spelled out in a lot more detail there. So make sure you go and read the syllabus which will tell you what is the expectations for the course and what not. Okay, so that's the uh, syllabus. Let me talk about a few other things. Okay, so course staff. There are some seats on this side and there is one here. So as far as course staff is concerned, um, as I am the instructor, my office hours will be on Mondays right after the lecture. Okay, so they are upstairs on the third floor. So if you have any questions, you can always come see me during office hours. Or if you cannot come during office hours, want to talk to me, email me and make an appointment. Okay, uh, there is a TA, uh, whose name is Ishan, that's his picture there. He will have office hours on uh, Wednesdays from 11 to noon okay, and Thursdays 3 to 4 p.m. also in this building okay, in room 207. Okay, So Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, three days of the uh, five business days, you can actually come see someone if there is any question. Okay. We have two more uh, course assistants, uh, Sandhya and Harish. There may be one more because the class is large and it's continuing to grow in enrollment. Okay, So we may have up to three course assistants. Typically, you will not deal with them on a face-to-face -face basis. Okay, but they will be handling uh, grading and a lot of other work uh, that you don't really need to see them face to face, but they will be part of the core staff. Okay. So that's the core staff. Let me talk a little bit about the textbook. So the textbook for the course is uh, actually fairly old at this point, about eight, nine years old. It's Distributed Systems by Tannenbaum. Okay, that's the hardcover version. Uh, the course, the book is now freely available. Okay? So you can actually go to this uh, website 
okay and get a free pdf <laughs> download it is now out of copyright the copyright has been given back to the authors so the authors have made a pdf a legal pdf copy available freely okay so you don't really need to buy one you can just go get the pdf okay, you can sit on this side let me just show you so if you go here you will see that you can actually go to this link and get a pdf for you okay, so if you like an online version don't want to pay for the book that's fine uh, there is now a paperback version that's also available if you prefer a printed copy there's a much uh, cheaper paperback version the authors have just made available i could find it on barnes and noble it is not available for some reason on amazon Okay, so if you like a printed copy, that's the cheapest one that I could see unless you buy a used copy somewhere. Okay, uh, and of course you can go to Amazon and rent a copy for the semester, you'll get this hard copy version. Okay, so you can uh, get by without paying anything at all should you want to go down that route. Okay, so with that, uh, let me uh, describe the course outline to you. This is the list of topics that we are going to cover over the next 24 or so lectures. Okay, so we are going to do the inter introduction today. I'm going to go over uh, what is a distributed system, do uh, some history of distributed system, talk a little bit about uh, operating systems and how they have become more distributed over time and so on. Okay, so that's today's class. Then we will uh, talk a little bit next time about distributed system architectures. Okay, what are broad architectural paradigms that have been used for building distributed systems and application. Okay, so that's uh, next. Then we will spend some time talking about distributed communication. I'll introduce the notion of remote procedure calls, remote method invocation. We will talk about stream oriented communication, audio and video streaming in distributed systems and topics of that sort. Okay. Uh, then we'll spend some substantial amount of time talking about processes, threads, distributed scheduling, virtualization, so all of the topics that come up when you talk about computation and processing in the context of distributed systems. Okay, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about naming and uh, name management and location management. So we'll talk about things like DNS, directory services, LDAP, and things like that in that topic. <coughs> And then a substantial portion of the course is going to be spent on talking about uh, what I call canonical problems in distributed system. So these are uh, topics that come up again and again when you design any distributed systems. Okay, so we'll talk about synchronization, we'll talk about leader election, uh, distributed transactions, whole slew of topics, uh, logical clocks, vector clocks. So they'll all be uh, discussed in the abstract but you will see them appear over and over again when we talk about real systems. And we'll see how those ideas are actually incorporated in real systems. Indeed, in the labs, you will actually use some of those ideas to implement simple distributed systems and applications yourself. Okay, so we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about uh, these canonical problems. And then the rest of the course is going to focus more on practical topics. So we'll talk about caching and replication and cache consistency. And then we'll talk, which is used to improve performance of distributed systems. We'll talk about fault tolerance. What happens if there are failures in a distributed system? How do you deal with that? Keep your system running. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about security. Okay, that's now uh, a topic of separate graduate level class. I'm not going to go too much into details on security, but we'll spend a little bit of time talking about security in distributed systems. We'll talk about middleware. And then uh, depending on how much time we have left, we will talk about the World Wide Web as an example of a distributed system. We'll talk about cloud computing, we we'll talk about big data systems, uh, mobile systems, maybe green computing. So those are advanced topics. I tailor them based on uh, how much time we have left and the interests of what the class is. Okay. So that's the outline. That's also roughly what's in the book. Not all of those topics are in the book. I will hand out uh, uh, extra material for you to read for new topics that are not part of the textbook. The textbook is, as I said, about eight, nine years old. The new things have happened since the book came out, so not everything we talk about here is in the book. Okay, any questions on the outline? Okay, 
So as far as uh, the rest of the course details are concerned, so let me talk a little bit about grading. So uh, much of the course grade is going to be dependent on lab assignments and uh, exams. Okay, so there will be three or four lab assignments, most likely three, not four, but I'll decide exactly how many uh, as we go along. Uh, that will be a good 45% of your grade. Okay, uh, the midterm and the final will be 40% of the grade. The midterm will be an evening exam. Okay, closed book, closed notes. I will decide and announce the date soon. Okay, so that you know what it is much ahead of time. Uh, the final exam is going to be a take home exam. Okay, so 24 hours take home. That will be an open book exam. The midterm will be closed book. Okay, so that's how we have done it. That's what we will uh, continue doing. Okay, so that's together the lab and the exam is about 85% of the grade. Okay, the homeworks and quizzes will be 13%. Okay, so uh, every week I'm going to hand out a quiz on Moodle. Okay, a very short quiz. You know, just to ensure that uh, both uh, the classroom section and the online section is following along. So you'll have to review the material from that week and answer a few questions. Doesn't take long, but it's just to keep you up to speed with what's going on in class. Because as you will see, we'll be covering material at a rapid clip. Okay, at the end of today's class, we would have covered most of chapter one. Okay, then next time we would have covered chapter two. So if you don't keep up, you're going to fall behind. So the quizzes, which don't account for a whole lot of the grade, will still keep you up to speed with what's going on. Okay, the homeworks are most of what is in there as far as the 13% is concerned, but the quizzes are part of that also, okay? And then there's 2% for class participation and online discussion. Okay? This class is not where I come and talk for one hour, 15 minutes and you listen. There's going to be a lot of uh, <coughs> discussions, you ask questions, and that's how most of uh, what we cover is actually going to be uh, learned by all of you, okay? so. Uh, the more you participate, the better it is for yourself and the rest of the class. And just to encourage participation, there is some percentage of your grade allocated to it. Okay. Uh, and so is if you participate in online discussions and whatnot. Obviously, the online section cannot ask questions. So for them, the participation is based on online discussion. Okay. So that's basically how the grading is going to be done. Any questions? So we will uh, have more to say about the programming assignments and so on uh, a little later on in the class. Okay, as I, as uh, you may know or may not know, uh, we will uh, have some freedom in what programming language you use and so on. Not a whole lot, but can give you a little bit of freedom on that respect. So uh, you don't have to learn something new in order to <coughs> complete the programming assignment. Okay, but you are expected, as is mentioned here, you are expected to know two things. You need some background in undergrad operating systems. If you haven't taken a class in OS and you want to succeed in this class, you should go and review the materials from an undergrad OS class. Because that will be assumed here. So I will assume you know something about whatever materials are covered in an undergrad OS. If you have any concerns about whether you have the right background, you can come talk to me. I have stopped enforcing any prereq checking. It's just too complicated. So I don't actually go and check that you have an exposure in undergrad OS. I will assume that you will do that check yourself. And uh, it's, uh, in your interest, if you have taken a class and forgotten the material or not taken it at all, to get a book on operating systems and review uh, the material. Okay. So that's one. Uh, thing I will assume. The other thing is that you know how to program the systems class. If you don't know how to program, it's going to be hard because 45% of your grade is going to depend on it. Okay. Okay. So that's the prereq. So here are some more things. There's a class mailing list. Uh, you don't need to do anything about the mailing list. You're already on it if you're registered for this class. In fact, I sent out an email on uh, Friday. So if you are already registered, you should have received emails and I will keep sending more announcements via the mailing list. Okay. Uh, we will use several different online resources for the class. There's going to be a Moodle page okay, where I will uh, post slides, lecture videos, homeworks, and so on. <coughs> okay, the main purpose of Moodle is also for you to turn in your uh, homeworks and lab assignments electronically. 
Okay, that's why there's no paper stuff you're handing in, things get lost. So everything is actually handed in electronically on Moodle. Okay, and grades will also be returned on Moodle. Okay, so uh, that's the Moodle page. There's the Piazza discussion forums. Okay, so um, that's where you can post questions, get answers to your questions. Uh, we will answer questions. Some of you may be able to answer questions other people are posting. So I would encourage you to go and register yourself on the forums today. Okay, don't uh, forget because uh, you should actually be keeping an eye out on what the questions people are asking and learning from the online discussions as well. Okay, uh, so let me show you. So that's the Moodle page. Okay, you should, if you're registered, you have access to it already. You'll see today's slides are already posted there. Uh, the video will appear there uh, maybe later today or tomorrow. Um, that's the Piazza page. You need to go register. There are only 13 students registered so far. There are about 100 now in this class. So make sure you go and register. You'll see that the email I sent is also posted as an announcement there. I'll be posting more announcements there soon. Okay, and you can ask questions there as well. Okay. And then um, just so that you know, this is more relevant for the online students, but also for you, there is a YouTube channel for this class, which is where the videos get posted. Okay. So I will obviously post the links to those videos on Moodle and on the course webpage, but you are welcome to go directly to the YouTube channel and watch videos as, uh, uh, as and when you need to. Okay. So videos, those videos are from last semester, so they're not relevant, but oh well, they might be relevant if you are interested in undergrad OS refresher. Okay, those are all uh, videos from an undergrad OS class. Okay, but the uh, videos from this uh, class will also show up on the same channel. Okay, so, and then there's a course web page, which is also something you should know. So those are all the online resources you should know as far as this course is concerned. Any questions? Okay, that's the discussion of the syllabus. I'm going to move on to other things. Okay, so let me uh, start with a refresher on, not really refresher, but introduction to distributed systems. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit later to a small refresher on operating system kernels. Okay, so why study distributed systems? So the motivation for why you should know about what distributed systems are is practically all online applications that you see today okay, are distributed in some shape or form whether it's the World Wide Web, Google, Amazon, peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer file sharing systems, you may have heard of SETI at home, cluster computing, grid computing, most modern network computer, including your laptop and phone, are distributed today. Okay, so practically every application that you may be accessing may be distributed, okay, whether it's email or social media or any other application that uh, has a network component. Okay, so it's important to understand how these applications are built, how these real systems work, how they scale to large number of users, uh, how they deal with failures and so on. Okay, so this is a good introduction to how to build modern complex systems, okay, which also happen to be distributed. Okay, so what we'll do in the class is cover basic principles okay, of how do you go about designing the systems. Okay, in the programming or lab component, you will get a feeling for how to do this yourself by building some simple distributed application and putting these principles to practice. Okay, so that's basically a good reason why you should know about distributed systems. So having said that, let me define what we mean by a distributed system. Okay, so essentially, it's a, a set of CPUs that are connected together over some communication medium. Okay, so there is a uh, definition, it's a collection of independent computers that appears to its users as a single system okay, that's also interconnected. Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, so essentially in a distributed system, you may have a set of N nodes, N machines. Okay? They are connected by some network. Okay, what that network is is not relevant, but they are connected so they can communicate. Okay? And as far as their users of this system are concerned, the distributed system might present a logical abstraction as if the entire system is a single logical system. Okay? So in some cases, the presence of multiple nodes may be hidden. In other cases, the presence of nodes may be visible to the user, but 
some other resources may be there. The fact that there is storage that is distributed may be hidden and so on. You want to sit somewhere here? Thank you. So, so that is basically a high level definition of a distributed system. I have kept it general and high level because we would like this definition to encompass a whole slew of systems that you find today. Everything from what are called parallel machines to network systems. Okay, so parallel machines essentially uh, are what are called tightly coupled systems. So in this case, you have more than one processor. Okay, so that's why it is more than one CPU. But the interconnect is not a real network. Okay, it would could it could be a high speed system bus or some sort of high speed interconnect, and all the nodes are inside one box, okay, inside one machine. Okay, but it meets our definition of a distributed system. Okay. And at the other end of the spectrum, you may have network machines, you might have laptops, you may have other machines that are just communicating over some network. And that's also from our perspective a distributed system. So it's a broad definition uh, that encompasses <coughs> all sorts of systems that you see today. Okay, High-end parallel computing machines as well as uh, machines that are loosely coupled using some network. Okay. So that's our definition of a distributed system. Now, uh, why build systems or applications in a distributed fashion? There are several advantages, and then there are several disadvantages of doing so as well. Okay. Uh, so let me start with the advantage. Okay. So it enables communication. It enables you the machines to communicate. It enables you to build applications that enables human to communicate. Okay. So email is a good example. Okay. You can communicate with your colleagues, friends using email. That's an example of a distributed system that is enabling communi human communication, not machine to machine communication. Okay. Uh, so, so it enables communication of all sorts. It allows you to share resources. Okay. You will see that in a distributed system, resources like disks can be shared across machine. You can actually access data that's stored on other machines. Okay. You probably do this already. If you use Dropbox or some sort of a cloud service, let's say Google Docs and so on, your data is stored on some other machine. Okay? Resources on those machines are actually accessible to you and you can access your data that may be stored remotely. That's an example of resource sharing. Okay? You're sharing storage as a resource over a network in this case. Okay? So it enables uh, you to write applications that um, allow resource sharing. Okay, so those are two examples. Now there are some cost examples as well. Okay, so uh, you can actually get economies of scale by building your systems using distributed uh, uh, machines that are distributed. Okay, so for what do you mean by this? So for example, you can take inexpensive commodity servers. Okay, you can connect them using uh, high-speed networks such as let's say gigabit Ethernet. Okay, and then you can run your applications on this commodity server. Okay, and then what you get from this is you basically get a system that allows you to scale where you can add more nodes if your needs increase over time. Okay, uh, you can also do this more cost effectively than buying a high-end multiprocessor system. Okay, because if you go and buy very high-end machines that are inherently multiprocessors, they cost you more. But you can get the same performance for a lower price by buying less expensive machines and then connecting them over a network and distributing your applications on those machines. And we'll see examples of doing this as we go along. We'll see how to build clustered web servers on commodity servers. Okay, you can scale up your website to lots and lots of users without essentially investing in a very high-end machine. You can get commodity servers and uh, replicate your application across machines. Okay, so, so that's an economic argument for why build systems in a distributed fashion. Okay, there are many others. You can get scale as you add more computing resources and storage resources to a cluster. Okay, you can actually scale your application to larger number of users. Okay, so if you have n nodes and your application runs over n nodes, you get n times the processing power of a single node. You get n times the storage. And hopefully, if you write your application well, your application as a whole should scale to n times as many users as a single machine. Okay, that's a scalability argument. Okay. The ideal case, you should get linear scale up, which you never 
actually get in practice, but you might get something close to a linear scale. But you will get some scale by designing an application web in a distributed fashion. You also get reliability. Okay. So what do you mean by this? So if some nodes of your cluster fail, of your distributed systems fail, an application as a whole does not need to go down. It can continue to run. Okay. If you had a single centralized machine that ran your application, okay, let's say the machine crashed. Okay, application stops functioning. Okay, it becomes inaccessible to its users. But uh, if you have n nodes that collectively run your application, okay, let's say some k out of n nodes fail. Okay, k is less strictly less than n. Your application does not need to stop functioning. If you have designed your system well, the other nodes can take over the tasks that the failed nodes are performing, and your system application as a whole continues to run. It may run in a degraded mode because there are fewer resources to go by. Okay, but it will still continue to run, which means you will you can provide higher availability to your users and whatnot. Okay, so that's a reliability argument. And we'll see how to build systems to actually get us there. Okay? If you uh, just build your system naively and your system has what are called single points of failure and some nodes fail, you'll still get your application to go down. Yeah, but you have to build it well for other nodes to take over the tasks that were running on the failed nodes and so on. So you need to do some extra work, but if you put in that effort, you will actually get better reliability. Yeah, and then there is potential for incremental growth, which is also an interesting argument. Yeah, this says that if you build a new application, initially the application may not be popular or you may not even know how many users are going to access it. Let's say you uh, design a new game. Okay, and you release your game as an application. Okay, when you do this, maybe you don't have any users at all, and or maybe over time the popularity of your game picks up, and you might start getting more users to use your game. Okay, now if you look at what the game server has to do on the back end, if you don't know a priori how many users are going to access it, you uh, don't have to go and invest a lot of resources by hundred machines and run your uh, game server on those hundred machines because it's complete waste of resources, you may not need that much capacity. So you could start by putting your game server on one machine. Okay? As your uh, user base grows, you can continue to add machines to your cluster and over time scale your application, in this case it's a game server, to, the, uh, to keep up with the user growth. Okay? This says that the investment that you have to make in order to scale your applications can also come gradually over time as the users grow. You don't have to decide beforehand how much uh, hardware investments to make. <coughs> yeah, so that is yet another advantage. If you had a centralized system or a multiprocessor system, you couldn't do this. You have to go and you have to buy a 64-way multiprocessor. Okay, you don't go, go buy a server and then go buy CPUs over time and start plugging them into a machine. That's not how parallel machines work. But for a distributed system, you can acquire individual servers and add them to your cluster. Okay, so so those are all good things as far as distributed systems are concerned. Any questions on this? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about disadvantages. Sir, okay. Yes. What is what is uh, what is PLs? Okay, so I will talk about it. PL programming languages. Okay, okay. so. Yeah. So, what are some disadvantages? So, disadvantages uh, include you need more complex features from your programming language. Okay, you are writing a distributed application. When you write code for your application, you need either programming language support or runtime support in order to build your application. Okay, so either your programming language or runtime has to be more complicated in order to support writing distributed applications. Yeah, so that goes without saying, the operating systems also become more complex okay, because they have to inherently support distribution features and enable you to run distributed applications. Yes. Uh, can you give an example of a programming language built specifically for this distributed system? Okay. Question is what programming languages are built for distributed systems? I'm going to use a very simple example. There are many. Uh, let's just take Java. Okay, so I'm assuming most of you know Java already. So Java actually has built-in features which you may or may not have used, but it does have built-in features to take any Java application and make it distributed. 
In particular, Java has features like remote method invocation, RMIs. Okay? RMIs en enable you to write client server application. That is built in language level support for writing a distributed application. Okay? In C and C++, there is no built in language support to implement RPCs. You have to use libraries. Okay? So that's an example. Okay? So if you have things like RMIs, you might have distributed objects in certain programming languages where your object that you instantiate doesn't sit on one machine, its state is distributed across multiple machines. That is again either a language level or runtime level support for implementing distributed applications. And as we go along, you will see some of these examples in more detail, but that's just a quick example here. Yeah, so, so distribution aware programming languages, making operating systems aware of this distribution, which you will see today in a little more detail, and an application. So everything the runtime, the OS, the languaging, the programming language all get more complex in order to support distributed systems. Okay, that's a disadvantage. Okay, the other disadvantage is network connectivity is essential for running distributed systems. Okay, the network is at the heart of a distributed system. It's a set of machines that are connected over a network. If your network goes down, your application as a whole will not function. Okay, so. Uh, so that's not necessarily the case for centralized application. If you have a standalone application that runs on your laptop, even if your laptop is disconnected from the network, it may continue to run, okay, but not a distributed application that needs to communicate with other components. It may be a server at the other end. Those applications will not run uh, if your network goes down. So network connectivity is essential. And the last disadvantage, but by no means the least, is that security and privacy concerns become more important in this context. Okay, you are exposing components of your applications over a network okay, so that other users may use it and so can malicious users. Okay, so now you have to think more carefully about how do you embed better security into your application, otherwise your application may get hacked by users. Okay, and this often happens, you put up a website uh, and then if you haven't taken the right precautions, your website may get hacked using all sorts of attack like cross site scripting and so on. And something you may not have been familiar with when you are writing smaller toy applications that were more centralized. Okay? So when you build any distributed applications, security is more important and so is privacy. Okay? If you are asking users to submit data, okay? maybe you ask users to register, maybe you ask them to provide you credit card information. If you don't safeguard all of this information, you compromise the privacy of your users, also compromise the security of your application. So all of these things become more important and you have to think about them carefully when you design your distributed uh, system or application. Okay, so those are all uh, some downsides or disadvantages in some sense of distributed systems. Yes, question. Is it still cheaper to build a distributed application because like you have to invest into network design and security? Okay, question is, is it still cheaper? It's, question is as cheaper as compared to what? Like the price performance ratio that you mentioned. Right. So, I will, so I'll talk a little bit about centralized applications. So there are some scenarios where you have no choice. Okay, you might have to build it in a distributed fashion to get a certain, meet a certain design goal. In other cases, you may have a choice. Okay, you may say, I could build this on and run it on a single machine, and if it needs a lot of users, I just buy a bigger machine. Okay? Or I just make it distributed, I put it on lot, maybe n smaller machines. Okay? When you have that choice, you can ask which is better. Okay, cheap, uh, cheaper is basically just one metric. Okay? You can get price performance, but there are many other aspects of cost. Programmer time. Okay, if you need more programming time to build your distributed application as compared to centralized one, that's also cost you have to pay. Okay, so it's not just the cost of hardware, a lot of other costs that you really have to think about hard when you talk about distributed systems. There is no right answer in some sense, but in what we will see is there are many inherent advantages of doing it this way that for many uh, scenarios, this is the better approach. Other questions? Okay, so I'm going to now talk a little bit about uh, a set of properties that you would like every distributed system to provide to you. Okay, and this is uh, what is referred to as transparency property. Okay, and there are many dimensions here. 
depending on what kind of transparency you're talking about. I'm not going to even explain all of these, just give you some examples. So you can have access, transparency, location, migration, replication, concurrency, and so on. So what this means is are you building your distributed systems to hide some of these aspects of your system? Okay, so if you take, talk about uh, location transparency, that says that inherently you are not exposing the location of a resource to your user. Okay, that's what is called location transparency. And I can give you a simple example. Okay, let's say if you go to www.amazon.com. Okay, this is how you actually visit the Amazon website. Okay, this name that you are using to go to the Amazon website does not reveal to you where Amazon servers are actually situated. Okay, so essentially the location of the servers is transparent to the user. You shouldn't know, neither should you care where the servers are located because you just want to go to the website and maybe shop for some products. Okay? So there is no reason for the system to be designed in a way that expects users to know this property at all. Okay, so which is a, you know, in this case is a good thing. Okay? You could have things like replication transparency. Okay? What that says is the fact that your application is replicated may be hidden from the user. Okay? Again, let's say you go to google.com. <coughs> okay? Now this name does not reveal to you that the Google search engine may actually be running on tens or hundreds or thousands of servers in the back end somewhere. Okay? It's massively replicated because it has to scale to millions, hundreds of millions of users. Okay? That's completely hidden from you. Okay? You don't actually go to node number 1 million and 10 or something like that. You just go to Google and it just figures out <coughs> which machine in its back end is going to service your request. Okay? So the fact that it's replicated is hidden from you. That's called replication transparency. Yeah, and so there are many others. A failure transparency which says that fact that a resource has failed is hidden from the user because uh, in the back end you basically just have other nodes take over the tasks and then you don't have to worry from a user who does not have to worry that their node failed and so on. Okay. So essentially if you design your application well, many of these properties of a distributed systems are hidden from the end user. You, the system designer still <coughs> has to deal with it. Okay. In fact, you have to work harder to not expose some of these details, unnecessary details in some cases to your users. Because users like use better usability. They want things to be simple. They don't want to deal with unnecessary details of worrying about where a machine is or the fact that the machine has failed and things like that. Okay? So these are all good design goals to also shoot for. Now in some cases you may not actually want to make some things transparent. You may want to expose some details to the users. In other cases, if you expose those details, the system becomes more complicated from a user's perspective. So you want to actually hide those details from the user. Okay? What is the right thing for your application is something that you have to decide as a system designer. Okay? So there are many of these properties. We will go into them in more detail as we go along. Okay? There's no need to go into them now because you will not fully appreciate what it takes to make some of these things transparent or whether you should make it transparent at all. <coughs> okay. Any questions here? Yes. Uh, you know, um, the distributed system, they hide the, uh, where the uh, resources are located. But for PPP system, it's a, it's a PPP uh, files sharing to say it's a uh, distributed system. That's but right. a host in a PPP system can know exactly the other host address if you have to. Yes. Okay. So question is, uh, if you have a peer-to-peer -peer system, a node in that system actually needs to know where other nodes are located. Yes. Correct? So, and you are saying that is actually not location transfer. Okay. So you have to distinguish between what machines and the applications know from what the user knows. Okay. It's essential in a P2P system for a peer to know about other peer nodes. Yeah. Okay. That's how the system works. The question you have to ask is, does the user need to know? Okay. If the user is looking for some object in a P2P system, does the user need to know what machine is stored on? The answer is in most cases, no. The system internally knows about its own structure and it can, which allows nodes to communicate with one another. So what this means is many of these details, the system might know, but it doesn't expose it to the user. 
Yeah, so that's the difference. Which is, I guess, the purpose of P2P systems for users to not know the locations of any of the parts of the file. That's right. So your user shouldn't know how the file is distributed. If you use BitTorrent, which we are going to study maybe in two classes from now, you will see that the file is chopped into chunks and stored on lots and or different nodes. If the system was designed where you had to know chunk one is on this node, chunk two go here to this node, download it, go here to the third node, then the system is completely unusable for the user. So you want to actually hide those details, but internally the system has to figure this out for you. Right? So, so those are all examples of how to build systems and what properties to expose. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on. So I'll talk a little bit about what are called open distributed systems. Okay, so essentially an open distributed system is one where either the system design is completely open and documented or at the very least the APIs that are exposed by the system are documented so others can use them. Okay, so uh, to, uh, what you see out there today is one where uh, most systems that allow you to interoperate or uh, work with them expose their APIs. Okay, so if you look at Google Maps, Google Maps has an open documented API. Okay, you can write applications, you can embed maps in your own application, you can query for locations and so on. That's an example of an open distributed system where the interface is well documented and open for others to use. Okay? In other cases, the code may be made available. Okay, Linux is an example of an operating system, not a distributed system, it's open source. In this case, the source code is itself available. People can use it and modify it. Okay, so, so what we mean by open could mean many different things. The source code is available, the design is documented, not the code, but the design is documented so that others can use it in some way, or at least an interface is made available and is publicly documented. Okay, the last of the, th uh, so as you go from the source code to design to API, you get less open because just because an API is available, you don't know the internal details, but you can still uh, interact with that distributed system. Yeah, so you will see that lots of services today have open APIs, whether it's Google or Facebook or Twitter, they all have uh, APIs that you can use to build other applications. Okay, so that's basically how modern web services are built as well. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about open distributed <laughs> systems. Let me talk a little bit about centralized systems just so that you appreciate the difference because I've just been talking about distributed systems. So if you, you could obviously build your applications in a centralized fashion, okay? But if you do so, you're, you will have to deal with three issues. Okay, you will have to deal with the service being centralized, the data being centralized, or the algorithm being centralized. Centralized service essentially means that there's a single server for all of the users. Okay, and then that server better have sufficient resources to service all of its users. For small applications, that may be okay. okay it may not need lots of user, uh, resources, so you could centralize certain services. Okay. Centralized data essentially says that the data used by your application is stored on a single machine. Okay, so you can think of uh, an online telephone book. Let's talk about, uh, uh, look at a real example. So you probably know UMass People Finder. Yes, what People Finder is, right? So if you go to the UMass webpage and you click on People Finder, that's the online telephone book for UMass. You can find any anyone who is a student or a uh, professor or staff using the people finder. That's the online directory that UMass provides. Okay, so one way to build that directory is to have a data, single database that has every employee, every student, every staff member in it. Okay? And then uh, the UMass people finder, when you type query, simply goes to that database, queries the data, and shows you some results. Okay, That's an example of centralized data, because there's a single database running on one machine that has all of the data needed by this application. In this case, that may be adequate because at UMass, you may have tens of thousands of users. Okay, 25,000 students, maybe 10,000 staff, faculty and staff. That's okay. What if you had uh, 1 million users? Would you still put that in a database and put that database on one machine? Okay, the answer is it depends. Depends on how many people look for this data. 
if you are not going to get a whole lot of requests for this data, maybe you can put it on one machine in a single database. Certainly, you can put one million records into a database. That's not a big database at all. Okay, but if you are going to get lots of requests, then your their machine may become a bottleneck. Okay, the database may become bottleneck. It may not have sufficient concurrency to support a lot of queries that are coming in. Okay, in this case, centralized data is a problem. You might have to partition your data and store some users' data on one machine, or other users on the other machine, and so on and so forth. Okay, very large mail servers have to do exactly this. Okay, when you have a small <laughs> Uh, organization, you can put your entire mail server on one machine. Okay? But now think about Google Mail or Yahoo Mail or any of these web mail systems that have 100 million users. If they put all of that email on one machine, it's never going to scale. Okay? They will essentially have to partition the data and store every machine. You have to store email from some number of users and you have a very large distributed system where the data is distributed. Okay? So that should give you some sense the difference between centralized data and distributed data. Okay? And same is true of algorithms. Okay? The algorithm that you use to implement your application may be centralized, which means it runs on um, one machine or basically it's essentially a single process, or it could be distributed. The algorithm itself could be distributed on multiple machines. The code on these machines cooperate with one another to achieve some higher level task. And again, uh, centralized algorithms work well, but there may be some scalability bottlenecks. Okay? And then distributed algorithms have their own problems because they are more complex. Okay? So, so those are all issues to think about. Okay? But whenever you start thinking of an application, you should think about what is it that I want to centralize? Okay? Do I want to distribute everything? Okay? Do I want to only distribute computation? Do I want to distribute data? It doesn't mean because you built a distributed application, all of those things have to be distributed. You might still put all your data in a database, but maybe the front end web servers could be clustered. It means the processing is distributed, but all those machines actually query a single database. Or you could say, I will distribute my computation, I'll also distribute my data, okay, and I distribute my algorithm. So it depends, you can mix and match. Okay, but you have to figure out what are the bottlenecks in your system and take those bottlenecks and to scale them up, those are things that you want to either replicate or distribute. Okay, So that goes to how you design your system. Okay, This is just a high level discussion to give you some appreciation of what are some issues you might face. Okay, Any questions on this? Okay, So moving on, so scaling is good, but there are many ways to drive <coughs> distributed systems. Okay, in particular, as part of this course, we will look at four different principles. Okay, let me tell you what they are, but we'll explain them in more detail as we go. Okay, if you want to make a purely decentralized algorithm, you need these four properties, which means no single machine should have complete state, which means data is not actually centralized on any one machine. You should try to make decisions based on local information. If you want to make some decision, if you have to ask every other node in the system in order to make that decision, that's inherently not going to scale. Local decision making scales better. Okay? A single failure should not bring down your system. There should not be a single point of failure and there should not be what's called a single global clock. Okay? Now, now some of these things you may not understand what I mean now, but as we go along you'll get a better appreciation. I do want to talk about uh, essentially uh, making decisions based on local information. Okay, in a few lectures from now, we are going to talk about uh, scheduling jobs on a cluster of machines. Okay? So job comes in, you have n nodes, and you want to run the job on one of those n machines. Okay? And you have to make a decision on which node to run this job. Okay? You could say, I will run it on the machine with the least load. That seems like a simple strategy. Okay? But in order to make that decision, you need to know the load on machines. Okay? Every time a job comes in, you go and ask all in nodes saying, send me your load information, and then you make a decision. That's an expensive scheduling algorithm, requires global knowledge. Every time you want to make a decision, I need complete global knowledge of what is the load on all of those machines. Okay? So that's an example of an algorithm that is actually not making local decisions. It requires global knowledge. On the other hand, you could make this algorithm randomized. 
you toss a coin, you pick node i and you send the job to node i. Okay? That needs no knowledge of the system at all. It's making a rand, completely random decision. Okay? That's also a distributed algorithm. And you might say, oh, that's maybe bad because it might sometimes send a job to a heavily loaded node because you toss the coin and pick the random node without knowing the load you sent it. Okay. And maybe that's good, maybe it's not. We'll talk about the properties of such algorithms later on. But that should just give you an idea of, in one case, you made completely local decision. In this case, it was a randomized decision. The other case, you made a decision based on global knowledge. And all I'm saying here is the less global knowledge you need, the better or more efficient or algorithm is in some dimension. Okay, maybe we'll worry about quality of the decision later, but that's just an example. Okay, is that clear? Yes. Um, so the, um, what's the no global clock mean? Like what the mean, meaning of no global clock? Okay, let me explain that. I will come to that maybe in a little bit later. So what is the global clock? So essentially what this means is, if you need uh, to design your application and make decisions based on uh, time at which certain events have occurred. Okay, so if you are maybe you want to maybe put some timestamps and make some decisions, then if you build your applications without in assuming that all nodes are completely synchronized, then you are better off. Okay. Yes, but in, um, uh, in some distributed system, uh, especially in they have the uh, global clock synchronized. Yes, so you can use clock synchronization, but that's not the same as global clock. Global clock says perfect synchronization. If your algorithm depends on all machines having their local times perfectly synchronized, that's inherently doomed because you'll never get perfect synchronization. What you can hope is to run some clock synchronization algorithm that can put the clocks within maybe a few milliseconds of each other. Okay, if that is tolerable error, then you are okay. If it is not, then you are not going to be. Now, let me give you a better example to make is this because clear. Because of like, you know, suppose like you want to fetch the time from like an NTP server. So, because of latency of different systems, so they will not be perfectly synchronized. Is it That's or? correct. So, when we talk about clock synchronization, we will see that you can actually have the clock on one machine be synchronized with the clock on another <coughs> machine. But there will always be some error. Okay, the error could be in the order of tens or hundreds of milliseconds. If your application depends on uh, the clocks being synchronized to better <laughs> precision than your clock synchronization technique provides you, then all bets are off. Okay? A good example, as we will see, is uh, GPS, which you are all familiar with, inherently depends on clocks being synchronized. Okay? And the more synchronized clocks you have, the better off you will be in pinpointing where your uh, GPS node is. So that's an example of one where if you had perfectly synchronized clock, you would get very high precision. But you don't have perfectly synchronized clock. Even in the GPS case, you will get very tight synchronization, but not perfect synchronization, which means that whenever you actually localize a GPS node, it is going to have some error, okay, which could be anywhere from tens to hundreds of meters. Okay, but you use other heuristics to then pinpoint your node. If you're driving, and your GPS clock says you are not on a road, it will actually use some heuristics and say maybe you are actually driving on a road or some such thing. Okay, So we will talk about that later, but that's just an example. If you could do away with these assumptions, you are better off, that's all I'm saying. Okay? Otherwise, you have to use a clock synchronization layer on top of your system to make your application work. Yes, question. So the global clock, when you say no global clock, does it mean the CPU clock or geographical time? So in this case, it means the CPU clock, that the time, the clock on your machine, if you can, if you do not have to assume that it is tightly synchronized with the other machine you are communicating with, you are better off. That's all I'm saying. Okay? Many applications inherently depend on timestamps. Okay? That's the other flip side of it. Okay? And they will like, the better synchronized you are, the better off you will be. Okay? And then a simple example I can give you is if you have used Make to build your application, Okay. Make depends on timestamps on files. Okay. What it simply does is it compares the timestamps of your source file with the timestamp of the binary that you have compiled. If you modified your source file since the binary was last compiled, it will recompile <coughs> your application. Okay. If you have not changed your source file and the uh, source file has a timestamp less than the binary, it will not recompile. So it inherently depends on timestamps. Okay. Now if you have 
a distributed environment where there are set of software developers okay, that are essentially all changing the code of your application and then there's a separate set of build machines somewhere else that are building your code which is an environment you will see in most software companies. You write code on your machine, you build it on some build servers, you just type build and some servers will build your code for you. Okay? So now the timestamp of modification is based on the clock on your machine. That if you save your file, it will take the local time and assign that to your file. Okay? The build machines have their own clock. They are going to actually compare the timestamp based on their clock. Okay? If the two clocks are not synchronized, then if you basically save and immediately type build and your clocks are even off by a few seconds, you might actually not get the right results. Okay? Because it inherently depends on comparing timestamps. Okay? And we'll see as we go along, there are techniques to get around this. Okay? But many, many applications actually depend on some form of clock synchronization. Okay? <clears throat> so let's move on. So there are other techniques that we will use. So those are all good things to have. Okay? We may not always get them, but they're good to have. Okay? But there are other techniques which say, Communication needs to be asynchronous. Uh, you could distribute code or uh, data across multiple machines and or you can actually cache and replicate. You'll see caching is a common technique that is often used as a performance optimization. If you cannot scale something, you often the first thing you will do is let's put a cache and try to cache frequently accessed data, frequently accessed code and see if that improves the performance. If that doesn't improve the performance, you have to go and revisit your design and fix them. But often putting a cache is a simple first solution to assure, ensuring your uh, distributed system scales up. Okay, So we'll look at all of those techniques as well. Okay. So let me now do a quick history of distributed systems and then uh, we'll stop. So all right, actually we have some uh, the OS history as well. So we'll do a history of distributed systems and look, look a little bit about evolution of operating systems and then they will stop. Okay, so as far as distributed systems are concerned, they have been around for decades. Okay, yes, your question. Um, by cache, you mean a separate cache server or cache on a local machine? Okay. So caching is a general technique. Okay, depending on where you put it, you can have a separate caching server, you can just put a memory cache in an application. I was just talking about it as an abstract technique for improving performance. Okay, where you put it depends on the scenario. Okay, so coming back to distributed systems, so uh, the earlier systems were built in the 60s and the 70s. So there has been at least five, six decades of evolution of distributed systems. Okay. And so you'll see that as uh, hardware has evolved, as costs have fallen, the uh, forms that these distributed systems have taken have also changed over time. Okay. And what you might uh, see today you might not even think of them as a computing device, let alone a distributed system. Okay, so we'll see the whole evolution from where we started many decades ago to what we have now. Okay, so early on, the common way of uh, distributing a system was what is called the mini computer model. Okay, so in this case, essentially, uh, this, these were days when hardware was expensive. It cost hundreds of thousands, million dollars to buy a machine. Okay, so you can't afford to buy a machine for every user. Okay, that simply doesn't work. What you would do instead is you could give a terminal to a user, okay, which is essentially a dumb terminal and it's connected to a backend machine and you can essentially log into the machine, submit jobs and so on. And you could have multiple users that were connected. They could all communicate with one another through a centralized entity. Okay. That's how the earliest distributed system started. Okay. And as machines got cheaper, okay, you evolved from this model. Okay, so from a mini computer model, you can go to a workstation model and this is when it uh, machines became cheap enough that you could actually put a workstation or a set of workstations could be made available to users. Okay? So in this case, what you could do is because they were still expensive, although you could afford it, they were expensive, you wanted to use those resources carefully. Okay? So for example, if some user doesn't show up for work, rather than letting their machines be idle, you can actually use their machines to run some jobs in the background. Okay? This makes better use of computing resources, which are still somewhat expensive in those days. But and you had more than one machine, so essentially you had a set of workstations. Okay? So from the workstation model also evolved the client server model, which is there even today. So in this case, we have two kinds of machines, a client and a server. Server offers a service, client accesses the service. 
and uh, lots of applications, the web, email, any different applications that you see today still use this client server model. Okay? And what this brings about is that there is a distinction between the client and the server. The assumption is that servers are more powerful machines than clients. Okay? Clients could be something like a phone, okay? not a very powerful device, still has four cores today, okay? which you couldn't have imagined some number of years ago, but not as powerful as servers. Okay? So in a client server model is assumed that client is less capable than the server. Okay? Server has more capabilities, so you ask the server to provide a service or perform some task for you. Okay? So that's the client server model. Okay? Uh, there's an analogous model here called the processor pool model. So in this case, what happens is you don't have one server, you have a number of servers that offer you a pool of processing power. Okay? And users are simply submitting jobs to this pool and your job can run on any processor in the pool. Okay? So this is also, you uh, today the, the, uh, this has taken the form of what is called cluster computing. You might have a cluster, you can submit a job to that cluster and it just runs your job. Okay, for if you have an account on clusters like Swarm in this department, okay, you will know what I'm talking about. So you can just submit a job, job goes in a queue and then it just runs on one of the many nodes that you have in the server. So nodes are essentially a pool of processing power. Okay, you don't care which node runs your job, you just want your job to, be, uh, to run and produce a result. Okay? So that is called the processor pool model that evolved uh, many decades ago and now it just basically continued to evolve <laughs> further. Okay, so we have gone from machines are very expensive, you can only have one machine, to you can have a collection of workstations, to you have client server or your servers are themselves a pool of machines and the pool of processing, uh, a pool of CPUs. Okay, so, oh, yes, question. Uh, when you mentioned the processor pool model, you said a job will be run on any node. Yes. Is the job further can also be split, that particular one job can be split to be run on multiple nodes? Okay, so question is, can you actually split a job to run on multiple nodes? That essentially goes to the heart of what is a job. Okay, typically, when users submit a job, a job is a collection of subtasks, which are a task is what you run on a node. A job may have many <coughs> tasks, and these tasks could be run in parallel. Okay, so it goes uh, to the definition of what a job is. Certainly, there will be applications that could be distributed for multiple nodes. Okay? You could just give what is called one task, and that task could be uh, distributed. But what I meant here was simply you submit a job. Job might require you to do n things. Okay, each of those end things is a task that you can run on one node and those could be parallelized. Okay. Okay, so that's the processor pool model. Uh, then we have, today we have cluster computing systems and data centers. Okay, essentially that's a cluster of servers with a local area network and this cluster can be used for many different things. It could be used for uh, processing jobs that I talked about. It could be used to run services, whether it's a web server, file server, mail server, you can essentially use that cluster to provide client server applications or to serve as a pool of processing power to uh, service bad jobs or run bad jobs. Yeah. So that is still there with us today. This has continued to evolve. You have now what are called grid computing systems, which are essentially clusters of machines that are connected with one another. Okay. So then uh, they essentially act as one larger logical cluster. So they're comprised of smaller clusters. Each cluster itself is a collection of servers. Okay, that acts as one larger logical uh, node, or not a node, but entity with a lot of processing power and storage. Okay, so you can have uh, grid computing systems, and this has continued to evolve. So you can have WAN-based clusters or distributed data centers. So if you know anything about cloud computing, you will know that most cloud providers will have more than one location where they can support your application. Okay, so essentially it is a distributed set of data centers. Each data center is essentially one location that has a very large cluster of machines and storage. Okay, so that is essentially what we mean by distributed data centers and that's basically has led to the evolution of cloud computing. Okay, we'll talk about cloud computing in more detail later. But for now, all you need to know is in a cloud computing model, you essentially rent resources, not buy them. Okay? 
you can rent them by the hour you can rent them by the month and you pay for whatever you use every month okay in a normal computing infrastructure you have to go buy machines provision them and then run your jobs on those machines in a cloud computing model you can rent as many resources as you want for as long as you want if you need more resources in a month you can just go and essentially acquire more machines from your cloud providers and then your bill will be correspondingly higher and then if your needs are done then you can just release your resources and next month you don't have to pay for them okay if you had to provision your own infrastructure you would not have that flexibility okay you would buy some machines and then you paid for them regardless of whether you use it or not in any given month okay so you might have underutilized systems if you just have to buy them <coughs> up front but in a cloud model you can essentially uh, scale your resource needs up and down as depending on whatever your application needs okay so we'll talk more about that later but this is essentially how computing in the context of distributed systems has evolved okay, and then they continue to evolve in a different direction okay so you have now what are called distributed pervasive systems where you have tiny nodes which could be sensors that are also essentially part of a distributed system they meet a definition of a distributed system okay nodes in a distributed system don't have to be actual computing node they could be tiny sensors with a microcontroller and a wireless radio okay and then if you have a, a, a number of them okay yeah, you basically have met the definition of a distributed system it's more than one cpu that's interconnected <coughs> by a network okay so a sensor network is an example of a distributed system as far as we are concerned Okay, so so you can have these small nodes, and they bring about a very different set of issues. Okay, because these are very small resource constrained nodes, you have to design your application carefully. You can't run very high end computation on very tiny nodes. Okay, so how do you design the system? How do you put where do you put computation? Where do you put storage? Even the amount of storage on these nodes may be limited. Okay, so so that's. essentially raises a different set of design concerns from traditional client server like application and then you will see now that practically any device that you see today has computing embedded in it right so you can have uh, a media center you can get an apple tv or a fire tv so even your tv actually is now a computing system okay it can run application you can stream uh, video to your tv and not something you could have thought of today So now you have to start thinking about a TV as a distributed system. Your car is a distributed system. It has microcontrollers. It has LAN. It has connected uh, uh, connectivity so that you can download weather information or stream music to your car. So is so all of these devices that you didn't think were computing devices a few years ago are actually now becoming <coughs> full-fledged computing platforms and essentially part of some distributed system. so this also raises and then this you can there are many examples here you can essentially think of a fitness band like fitbit that you wear that's also uh, has a bunch of sensors on it it measures some aspect of your activity or health and it uploads your data to some cloud server another example of a distributed system yeah so essentially as computing has become very cheap it's now feasible to put computing and networking everywhere okay essentially that has caused a whole slew of new domains to essentially become enabled by computation and sensing so you have now all these new distributed systems that have emerged which we will call distributed pervasive system they are, they are pervasive they are everywhere so you don't even think of those devices as computing systems let alone a distributed system okay but what this points out is also that how you design the systems has to fundamentally change okay because uh, Uh, as computer scientists or computer engineers we are used to systems hanging and failing and you reboot your machine if your machine fails okay this does not uh, carry over to the real world people don't want to reboot their car right you cannot tell people that your car is hung so please reboot it but if you have self driving cars that is where you may go okay you have to do software updates to your car every two months okay this is going to be not a good way to expect users who are not necessarily used to how computing systems work uh, expect these applications to behave neither should you want to reboot your tv every two days because it hung on you or some such thing but that does happen a two day smart tv 
Okay, so essentially you want to build your systems to be a lot more reliable so that all of these things that we are used to because software is inherently buggy and so on should not actually carry over when systems become pervasive because other users who are not necessarily computing oriented are not used to these things neither do they expect these things to happen okay so so that essentially says that we have to really think hard about how we build this system and what we've been doing until now cannot actually continue as we go forward okay so with that i'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about operating systems okay so uh, so i've did a quick run through to the evolution of distributed systems let me talk a little bit about evolution of operating systems okay, so essentially this is uh, just a refresher from an undergrad was class okay so while operating system we essentially mean the operating system kernel okay and what it does is it's essentially you can think of it in many different ways it is a resource manager that manages the hardware resources on your machine okay it arbitrates between application the multiple applications make competing demands on the cpu or your disk or your network it employs scheduling that decides how these resources get allocated to the applications okay and the other way to think about an os is that it provides a logical interface to its user okay users don't need to worry about where on disk files are stored to access a file you use the file name and the directory you don't say go fetch this data from block 23 on my disk okay the os takes care of that for you okay when you start an application or you run a process you don't say load it to this address in memory and allocate so many megabytes to this process the os takes care of that for you okay all of those things have to happen but the user doesn't have to deal with it lot of those things are hidden from the user the os is going to manage all of that complexity for you and provide you a much easier interface to use so that you can actually do your work and not have to worry about arcane details of the hardware okay so that's basically what an os does and operating systems have also evolved over time like distributed systems early os kernels were monolithic in nature all of the code for your kernel was basically written as part of one single process that booted up when you booted your machine okay, so everything that was in the kernel was part of one process okay this made uh, it very hard to maintain your operating system in order to make any changes you have to be an expert in all aspects of that os so an os designer had to be an expert in lots of things not just the part of the os they were modifying and as os became larger and more complex that was more very hard to scale up yes what do you mean monolithic also monolithic means just one thing right so there's one process that was going to boot up so the entire os kernel is essentially part of a single address space okay so that is monolithic kernel and then as time went by people said that's a very bad software engineering practice to build your such a large complex system in a monolithic fashion so why not structure it in some way and there are many different structures that evolved one is layered design where your os could be structured in layers okay and layer i can only talk to the layer above and the layer below it okay that's a layered design okay typically the entire os does not employ a layered design but the network subsystem in the os uses a layered design because the protocol stack like tcp ip are layered by definition so it's easy to write the network protocol stack in a layered fashion where you might have a mac layer and the network layer and the transport layer and so on okay, so the network subsystem certainly uses the layered approach but that's more modular than just a monolithic protocol stack okay you might have other structures as well where you can the more modern operating systems actually use what is called a modular architecture you can write components of your os kernels as modules that are loaded when the os boots up that is how device drivers work as well device drivers are essentially modules that you can insert into the os they don't have to be part of the core os kernel code base okay they basically can be inserted and so are many other things that are not device driver they are also built as modules okay that's a better more modular approach to designing modern operating systems okay so i said that let me show you a very different way of designing an os kernel which is called a micro kernel architecture in a micro kernel architecture essentially what has happened 
is you have made your OS highly modular. What is now in the kernel is a very small code base which is called a micro kernel. All it does is it enables communication and provides some basic security features. Everything else that you expect your OS to do is now happening outside the micro kernel and in fact it happens as individual processes that run in user space. So your memory manager is essentially a process. It looks like an application. Okay? CPU scheduler is a process. File system is a process. Okay? They are OS processes, but they are processes, independent processes. They are not part of the kernel. Okay? And now these processes will obviously have to communicate with one another to carry out typical OS tasks. And your microkernel is just enabling this communication. That's the role of the microkernel. So you pulled all of the OS features out of the kernel and you're running them as independent processes in user space. Okay, this makes the OS highly modular. If you want to modify your file system, you only need to look at the file system processes source code. You don't even need to worry about the rest of the kernel and that's all you need to modify. That's all you need to know. Okay, if you want to change the memory management, you only look at the memory manager. Okay, so, from a software engineering standpoint, this is as far as you can push it. So, you not only made it modular, you made pieces independent of one another. Okay, so, so, many people also believe this is a more secure way of building operating systems. Okay, because if you have bugs in your kernel, which are likely because this is a large piece of software, you are not going to expose bugs in one part of your kernel to other parts because they're independent address spaces. Okay, so if you hack the file system, you can't actually go and get access to the RAM, for example, because that is managed by different process. If you had a single pro uh, process that was your entire kernel, if you get access to the process, you get access to everything the process can do. Okay, so some people will uh, argue that micro kernels are a more secure way of building operating systems. Now, those are all good things as far as microkernels are concerned, but there is a downside of building operating systems this way. Complexity. Okay, complexity, yes. What we talk say? about memory volume. So, this memory volume is stored in user space or some global uh, space? The memory manual is essentially a user process. Okay, so all of these are user processes. Okay, I'm saying it if there are multiple users trying to access the system, so isn't it better, isn't it better to have a global memory system that takes care for all the users. That is what this is. This is a memory manager. Okay, when processes start, the OS has to allocate memory to a process. That's what this thing will do. This is not RAM. This is memory management in the OS. But this thing is like individual for each user. No, it is just, just running as a user process. It's a one process that is doing all of the <laughs> memory management. Okay, it doesn't mean every user has this. It just means that there is one it's running in user space as opposed to in kernel space. That's all it means. This is kernel space, that's user space. Okay. So let me just, yes, you're, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> so performance, as is being pointed out, the main downside here is that performance is going to be much worse than traditional kernel. Okay, the reason is to perform any task will involve more than one of these user level processes. That will mean that each of those processes have to be scheduled, you have to context switch from one process to another. If the memory manager wants to interact with, let's say, the CPU scheduler, which is here, okay, that involves sending an explicit message from this process to that process. In a normal kernel, that would be a function call from the memory management code to the CPU scheduler. Okay, function calls are a lot cheaper than actually sending a message. In fact, sending a message is order of magnitude more expensive. Okay, so any OS task here is going to involve a lot more overhead, which means that your OS as a whole is going to be a lot slower than any modern OS that does not employ a microkernel architecture. This has been fundamentally the downside of microkernels. In fact, in uh, the 90s, many OS, uh, commercial OS has actually decided let's do the microkernel thing because it's more secure. Okay, so Windows went with a microkernel architecture, OS X went with a microkernel architecture. Okay? They soon found that machines slowed down so much that users really couldn't bear the performance hit, that microkernel architecture. 
So what they then started doing is saying this performance is too slow. So let's start taking some of this and pushing it back into the kernel. Okay. So then you have a hybrid model where more and more functionality is getting pushed back down and you're back to where you started, which is what many kernels today have evolved. So modern Windows and modern OS X have still have some roots from micro kernel days, but a lot more functionality has gone back into the kernel because the performance it was just too much for most users to deal with. Okay, so that's where uh, they ended up. So we've run out of time, so I'm going to stop here and then continue the remaining slides next time.